I shall not be in the wall. He makes me lie down in the green pasture. He leadeth me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness. For his name's sake, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and love will follow me. All the days of my life, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. So be it. that can't be here that are sick Lord provide your healing hand upon them be with our nation Lord in this time of where, where we are divided Lord and we don't know what's going on shepherd us Father Lord we know that you are in control but so many times we try to walk by sight rather than by faith Lord just fill us with your spirit give us the faith to stand firm that we may boldly proclaim the gospel message of Jesus Christ be with us today Lord as we read your word have your spirit rain down upon us. We thank you for the rain that is refilling our land, Father. And we just thank you and praise you for all of your goodness and mercy. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So I entitled this, The Shepherd's Love. Um, this one won't be offensive, maybe like last week and maybe next week, because I'll get back on the other one where Jesus talks about cutting people to pieces. But this time we're going to talk about the shepherd's love, because it's easy to talk about the good things. Because God is so wonderful. The shepherd is one of the biggest motifs or illustrations throughout Scripture. God as our shepherd and Jesus as our shepherd. God is our shepherd all throughout the Old Testament. And He sent His Son to shepherd us. And then to become the sacrificial lamb for us. We're introduced to the idea of shepherd way back in Genesis. In Genesis 48 verse 15 we read, Then He blessed Joseph and said, May the God before Him before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. It was a concept that goes way back, a concept that Jacob or Israel had. They understood that God would shepherd them and take care of them, but yet they turned their back on God so many times, didn't they? And they wandered away, just like the song says. God provided all their needs. He showed mighty, wondrous acts and showed the world that He was God. But yet his children so many times wandered away. But God was always faithful, will always be faithful, because it's the character trait of God. He will always stand true to his covenants. And his word is clear about that all the way through. At the end of the book, the Bible, we read in Revelation 7, 17, For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. <laughs> That's us. Yay. <clears throat> and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. King David is the one who wrote Psalm 23. He didn't write all the Psalms, but he wrote a lot of the Psalms. He had personal experience because he had been a shepherd boy who watched his father's flocks and then later became the shepherd king of the nation of Israel, God's chosen children. He wrote Psalm 23, but we don't know exactly when, but reading the Psalm, it seems to be that he had a little more maturity, a little more hindsight behind him than he might have had if he wrote it when he was younger. Don't we see that? If we could have the hindsight today that we had years ago, would we do things a little differently? It seems to carry the experience of a man's words. So he's probably a little older and a little more wiser when he wrote and penned these song, this song. I like the King James Version for this, so I'm going to read it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. 
my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now see, we don't know what it means to be a shepherd. Maybe you've kept some animals and, and you're a little familiar with them. But we've got to go back to the times in Israel when, when David wrote this psalm and understand what it meant to be a shepherd. It's not something we're familiar with, so we can't understand and fathom everything that David was writing down and, and the passion that he wrote it with. In Old Testament Israel, the shepherd was not a upstanding position. Now it wouldn't matter if we shepherd or not. It would be another occupation. But in that times, it was more of a lowly, subordinate position. It was a hard and dangerous job. Something that required work from sunup to sundown. Oh, and it didn't end at sundown because he still had to watch over his flock. <clears throat> there was usually one head shepherd. Maybe the family did it together, but you usually had one head shepherd. And many times you had just one shepherd out there in the field. He was a nomad shepherd watching over the flocks. The flocks that provided everything that we needed. They provided the wool for our clothing. They provided the meat for the table. They provided the milk for for the drink. They were definitely something that, that we needed to survive in that day. And the shepherd had to provide all of their care. This lone shepherd was, was responsible for the protection and care of his flocks. He didn't interact that much with people. His interaction was with his sheep. When he came into the town and stuff, he might have even not been able to get along that well with the people because he was familiar with and was around his sheep. They were his family. <clears throat> if the sheep got lost, he had to go back and find them. He had to provide water, food, protection, rest and healing and nurturing care for the sheep. He had to carry the animals in his arms at many times when they're young or when they were sick. He had to help give birth, carry the newborn around until they could walk or, or care for the mother until she was able to walk. Whatever the weather was, whatever the danger was at hand, the shepherd literally meant life or death for his sheep. It didn't stop in wintertime. I don't know about you, but when it's wintertime, I go into the barn, feed my horses hay, and that's it. I don't mess with them. But the shepherd was out there all of the time watching over his flock, taking them to where they needed to go for, for food, for water. He had to protect over them. He had to find a place for them to sleep securely. Without the shepherd, the sheep would surely die. <clears throat> he had to herd his flock at many times to find the grazing lands. And the grazing lands may be far away from each other. He had to water the sheep. And the watering, he had to do at the right time before they got too dehydrated or in uh, tension or anything. And he had to go to those watering lands. And those watering lands may be a far, far place away. He had to put the sheep up in some type of secure pen at night. And he literally would be the gate for the sheep. Nothing would be able to get to the sheep without passing through the shepherd. There were many serious dangers. The hot and cold weather, the lack of food and water, and predators. Not just animals, but thieves and robbers who wanted to steal, kill, and destroy. The shepherd wore a mantle of wool to help keep him warm, and he carried tools so that he could better do his job and watch over the sheep. The dangerous predators wanted nothing to do but to kill eat, and destroy the sheep, no matter who the predators were. Sounds a lot like Satan, doesn't it? We don't want to forget that we fight a spiritual battle. That's what he wants. He doesn't want to hurt you. He wants to destroy you. He wants your worship. He wants to steal it from God and destroy you from a life eternal. <clears throat> Jesus described the duties of the shepherd when he talked about himself in John chapter 10, verses 4 through 7. Jesus said, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Now Jesus isn't literally talking about sheep, is here. He's talking about you and I. And we forget so many times, we remember that he came to give us life, but we forget the part that he has come to give it to the fullest. 
Because we chase after the things of this world instead of chasing after treasures built up in heaven. We forget what we're longing for and living for, our salvation, and to experience a life of eternity with God the Father and God the Son, God the Spirit in heaven. If we had our eyes focused on that, the things of this world wouldn't mean quite as much. We could walk a little bit more by faith. We could understand the words that David wrote down a little bit more, that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The shepherd is the one and the only one who truly cares for the sheep. Many other people will cry out, but they won't listen to his voice. They listen only to the shepherd's voice. We could definitely learn something here. The shepherd loves his sheep, provides for his sheep. He is the gate for the key sheep. He is the life for the sheep. The climax of the whole relationship is, is that the shepherd lays down his life even for the sheep. That is what the Bible is all about from the beginning of Scriptures to the end of Scriptures, that God is the good shepherd, that He provides the lamb for the slaughter, Jesus Christ, who will shepherd us. There's no other shepherd, no other way, no other truth, no other life, but Jesus Christ, the sacrificial lamb, the lamb that was worthy because He was slain for our sins. Do you see what the Bible is all about, the relationship of this shepherd to his sheep? Maybe you'll look at it a little different when you go by and see some sheep out there in the pasture and, and understand the care that had to be provided for them. And not only the care that was provided for them, but the love and the passion that was behind them. That God would love us so much that He would send His only Son to die for us so that we could be brought back into the fold. David knew this concept and imagery very well. He was a man that God called, said that he was after his own heart. He knew that passion, that desire. Even as a young boy, he understood it. And he understood it even more when he had to shepherd the, the kingdom of Israel. <clears throat> In 1 Samuel, we read about David when he encounters Goliath. In 1 Samuel 17, verses 32 through 37. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart. We have a battlefield full of Israelite soldiers who've seen and experienced everything, who know that God can provide for them, and they're afraid of one giant. And, and David says, let no one lose heart. Because he knows that God looks at the heart. He knows that the decisions come from our heart. Our heart is what motivates us to what we want to see, what our mind wants to concentrate on, what our passions are set on. That's our heart. He knows that, that the heart leads to faith, which leads to righteousness. And his heart is focused on God. So he can say, let no one lose heart. Saul, on the other hand, was the king of Israel and did not understand this concept. Verse 33 says, Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine. Well, of course David's not. He's a little boy. But David isn't fighting the battle. God is. And David had the faith that he said, I'm not afraid. I'll go out there. And Saul couldn't see this. Saul was the exact opposite of a man after God's own heart that David was. He lacked the faith because his heart wasn't focused on God. It was focused on the things of the world. <clears throat> You're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. You think that matters to God? We think the same things. We say, God, I can't do this. I don't have the power or the might. If God is telling you to do it, then you're going to do it, if you do choose to do it, by the power of God, not by the power of your own might. But David said, there's that word but, David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. He knew exactly what it meant to keep the sheep. He knew that this was God's sheep, the, the nation of Israel was that God did not want anything to happen to His sheep because He wanted it for His glory and His honor that the Philistines be defeated. I'm sure He had a little bit of fear. We're men. We're going to have some fear. But He knew that God was with Him, so He was willing. <clears throat> he knew what it meant to be a shepherd, and He knew that God was His shepherd. Continuing verse 34, it says, When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the, from the flock, I went after it struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. David didn't just uh, protect this flock from the animals. If the animals got the sheep, he went on after them. 
I don't know about you, but if a bear comes down and gets my dog, I'm not going to go after the bear. I'll try to protect my dog before the bear gets to him, but I'm not going out after the bear. Now, we have uh, shotguns and other things, right? But he had his rod and his staff and his sling, the tools of a shepherd. I don't really think I'd be going after a bear. But David knew God's heart for his people. He had faith. <clears throat> When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. So here's where he's bringing it back to perspective. This uncircumcised, uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. He didn't see him as a giant. He didn't see him as a threat. He saw him as someone blaspheming God and the nation of Israel. His, God's sheep. Because he has defied the armies of the living God. Not because he's defied me, or not because he's defied Saul, but he's defied the armies of who? The living God. Verse 37, the Lord, he gives his credit right to the Lord. He didn't say, I have the might, I have the power. He said, the Lord who rescued me, I'm going to acknowledge why I'm still here and breathing today. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Maybe you should memorize that verse. Because when you're in doubt and fear, when you've wandered off and when the valleys are dark and low, know that God is with you because you are His child. If He loved you enough to send Jesus to die for your sins, He's not going to forsake you in your time of trouble. He wants the very best for you because you are His son or His daughter. So Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Now maybe he was convinced, maybe he wasn't. Maybe he just wanted David to go and, and quit bothering him. I don't know for what reason. But I see the faith that David has here. Sure, he might have been scared or anything else, but he had the faith to face a giant and an army that backed him because this giant was not against him, but he was against the living God. So David wrote this psalm with that understanding. He wrote it as a psalm or a poem of worship to God. That God is our shepherd. Our Lord is our shepherd. He knew very well what that meant. The day-to-day -day activities of a shepherd were very long and very challenging. At daybreak, they had to get up and take their flocks to the pasture. And like I said, that may have been a good ways away from where the sleeping place was. Because they would have picked a sleeping place that he could naturally defend it with a rock wall or something like that. And you'd have to take the sheep back out of there to go to the pasture land. The pasture provided food, but it also provided a resting place from the heat of the day. He had to find a vantage point where he could watch over his sheep. And if they wandered off or if a predator came, he had to make sure that he got his sheep rounded up. He watched constantly for impending threats. So he couldn't rest and, and just take it easy. He had to be on guard for what might happen to the sheep. And then at the right time when he saw that the sheep were starting to get parched and so forth, he'd have to take them to the water source, calculating in the time that it would take to get there. If you remember the Samaritan woman, she walked a good ways from town to get to the well. Watering sources were not prevalent in the land. They had to go to wherever the water was. So he would lead him to the watering source and have enough time to get there. And if you notice from the pasture that he has to find still waters because a sheep won't drink out of raging water because raging waters are distracting. They might not see or hear the predator that's there. They might get swept away by the currents. A good thing to consider because so many times we get distracted by the currents of life. But the sheep want to drink out of still waters. So he leads them to the still waters. Then he has to take them back to, to the pasture so that they can finish their nourishment. He has to watch over them carefully, counting and looking after each sheep, no matter whether they're young or no matter whether they're old. And he makes them lie down and rest when they need rest. So many times we fail to see that, that God wants us to rest in His peace and in His love. We get so busy with life, we don't take time to rest. When one of the things that we're looking forward to so much in heaven is that eternal rest in Jesus Christ. 
Now, I'm not saying that we're not going to do anything, but we have eternal rest and eternal peace. And God wants us to work, but He wants us to understand that peace in life now. It's not about chasing after things or dreams. It's about living a life that brings glory and honor to God and resting in that peace that we have in this world. <clears throat> if his sheep go astray, the shepherd has to go out and look for them. Jesus came from heaven to earth looking to save us. That's how far of a distance he came to save each lost sheep. Isaiah 53, 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus didn't come to save everyone. He came to sing, save every single one. He came individually to have a personal relationship with you and I. Because see, the God of the Old Testament is the Father of Israel. But us as Christians today have an individual father that we can call Abba, Daddy. We have that personal individual relationship. Because as a prog story progressive, we see God's love for each and every individual. No matter what they've done, no matter what they'll do. Jesus loves them because God loves. And He comes to, to go after each and every lost sheep. Humans are like sheep. They've all gone astray. 1 Peter is clear about this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22 through 25. It says, He who committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. For you were like sheep gone astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Maybe your version says guardian or bishop. But because of the love of God made manifest in Jesus Christ, we have a shepherd that has come to find each and every lost sheep. To not only protect them, protect them from the dangers, but to provide for them all that they need and to give them rest. God doesn't want to lose one single sheep. So do you believe this in your heart? David worshiped God from his heart. If you believe this, then you are covered by the blood of the Lamb. You have returned to the overseer of your soul. You don't have to fear anything else because God controls the outcome of your soul. He has the power to condemn you to hell or the power to offer you righteousness, which will, turn, will, which will lead to eternal life through Jesus Christ. But we've got to decide. We've got to decide if we want that or not. He provides every single thing that we need. We don't need to be distracted. The sheep aren't distracted. They listen to the voice of the shepherd. They go where he leads him. Yeah, they might wander off, but it wasn't because that they saw a new boat that they needed more than this. Or There's one out in the parking lot anyway, if anybody wants to buy one. They're focused on what the shepherd does for them. They might get distracted and wander off, but they don't chase after the things that we chase after. They listen to the voice of the shepherd because they know that the shepherd loves them. They may not understand that he means life and death, but they understand that the shepherd is there for them. He cares for them. He loves them. He nurtures them. Back to the life of the shepherd. Before it was dark, he had to gather up the sheep. I don't know about you when it gets dark, but that's when the predators come out too, doesn't it? So they're starting to lurk even more. And he has to get the sheep back to the fold, watching over each and every one. He counts them as he puts them into the fold, and then he literally becomes the gate for the sheep so that nothing can get to them without coming through Him. They're safe. They're cared for and protected. They have rest in the shepherd. Nothing can get to the sheep without coming through the shepherd. So guess what that means to the shepherd? That means he doesn't just get to sit back and relax again, does he? He's there caring for and watching over and protecting his sheep. <clears throat> The shepherd has a lot of tools and rep weapons. One that we read about in Psalms 23 is a staff or a club, a rod, or a club. 
He has a rod also, a sling, a knife, a pouch, and other items. These items are used for several reasons. The biggest reason is not necessarily for protection because he does a lot more guiding during the course of his day than he does for, for protection. So that staff usually has a crooked end. He can literally reach out there and grab the sheep and pull him to him. He might pull him to him to give him love. He might pull him to him to see about a cut that's on the sheep. He might pull him to him because the sheep is wandering off. But he uses that staff more for guidance than he does for warding off enemies. He has a rod which is a little more like a knocking stick, like a policeman's nightstick or something like that. So you'd think that would be just a, an, a tool that he would use for the predators, correct? But sometimes we need a little knock on the head, don't we? So he uses it for direction also when the staff is not necessarily enough. We have to give us a little thump on the head and say, hey, come back over here because I love you. You're getting distracted. <clears throat> a sheep has no natural defense mechanism, so he has to use those tools to ward off predators as well. They don't have claws. They don't have camouflage. The only defense mechanism a sheep has is the herd. Huh. The church for us. Look at that. We can come in here and know that we're protected and loved and cared for. And the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts so that we can use them to build up the body and protect the body. A lot like a sheep herd, isn't it? Or flock. That is limited though. So they need the protection 24-7 of a shepherd to watch over them and care for them. Without the shepherd, they'd be easy pickings to the world. And our adversary, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It's a concept in the New Testament as well as in the Old Testament that we can easily become prey if we don't realize what's going on out there. That we fight a spiritual battle. And that our God in heaven and our Lord Jesus Christ is there to shepherd us all the way through. Sheep don't always listen though. They're kind of like us, don't they? We need to listen to God. So David was pouring out his psalm, pouring out his heart in this psalm, so that the nation of Israel could hear these words, that they could sing these words and sing praises to God. So they would understand what it meant for the Lord to be their shepherd. Verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David knew what it meant to be a shepherd. He knew the responsibilities. He knew that God loves him. He foresaw the coming of Jesus Christ as the Messiah, who would be the sacrificial lamb. God's job is to direct the sheep's life, us, his sheep, Every single step of the way. He is the one that protects us, that watch o watches over us and cares for us. Therefore, David knew without a doubt, the Lord is my shepherd. Not He might be my shepherd. Not He's my shepherd sometimes. But He is my shepherd. And I lack or desire nothing as a result. All of my needs are fill filled. I don't want another thing. Even though... I'll have problems in this world. It doesn't matter. Because God is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. I said that a little bit before. The green pastures provide nourishment. But He also lets me lay down and know rest and peace that I will never know on this earth from created things. I can only know them from the Creator. And He leads me beside still waters, those quiet waters that comfort me and provide me with the quenching that I need for my very spirit. The Word is living water to us. Jesus is living water to us. His Spirit is. By the words of God, we find refreshment for our very soul. He leads me to those quiet waters where I can find peace, that I don't have to worry about the other distractions, the predators that may be lurking. And I don't have to worry about being swept away. Verse 3, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He restores my very soul, my life, the breath that He gave me in the first place when He created me because He desired to and He created me in His image. 
The very life that He saved when He sent Jesus to die for my sin. The very life that He sealed with the Holy Spirit so that I would know that I was His own and that I would know that I would spend eternity with Him. He leads me on the true path, the path of righteousness, the path that Jesus walked and talked. Because Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. It's a path that is safe. No matter when we think things aren't safe, we know that that path is safe and secure because we're walking the path of our shepherd. So that He may be honored and glorified, not so that we can live a life of self-fulfillment, but that we can live a life of worth, honoring our God and Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me, Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. I don't care what the circumstances look like. If I can't see out because of the valley that I'm in and I can't see beyond that, and the fog has settled in or anything else, I don't need to see what's going on because I know what's going on because I'm walking the path of my shepherd. I know that I'm safe and secure. I will fear no evil. Not some. I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Every step of the day, every second of the day, I don't have to fear because you will never forsake me or leave me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. They're for, they're for comfort, and if I need a little nudging or knock on the head, they're there for that, and I praise God for it. If God is, against, if God is for us, then who can be against us? <clears throat> Verse 5, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemy. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Maybe you notice a little change here. I think... What this means here is I'm grasping the reality of what my life really is. That my life is a stepping stone to an eternity with God. That it is not my life. It is His life. He created me. He gave me life. He restored me back to the fold through Jesus Christ if I simply believe. So my life is not my own. So He's not preparing a table for me here. Maybe I have wealth here. Maybe I have nothing here. But if I believe in Him and follow after the shepherd, I have everything in heaven. He prepares this table before me in the presence of mine enemies. They think they have it all figured out. They think it's all about this world. But He's preparing a table for me in heaven. Because just like a prodigal son returns to his father, I will go to heaven and I will enjoy in the feast that He has prepared for me. Because I once was lost but now I'm found. My enemies won't know that. He anoints my head with oil and my cup runneth over. I'm not only blessed, but I'm blessed beyond capacity, beyond anything that I could ever comprehend or measure. I don't know what heaven's like. I can only imagine as the song says. But even if I, He told me exactly, I could still never imagine. Because I'm inheriting as a son of the Father, what God Almighty has. I, can't, I can never conceive that. What a wonderful, glorious place it's going to be. So surely, without a doubt, verse 6, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Not just the one on this earth, but oh yeah, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Wow. The words that David is writing to his people that we can see how much love that the shepherd has for his sheep, how much love the father has for his children, that we can see that when he sends his only son to die for us so that we won't worry about the things of this world. We won't chase after them. We won't get distracted. But we'll follow in the footsteps of the shepherd and let him nourish and care for us. The reason I decided to talk about Psalms 23 this week instead of continuing on is <laughs> the word shepherd is also tr translated some as pastor, isn't it? So I want to say thank you and you have one more day of Pastor Appreciation Month. But you know what? You guys appreciate and love us so much. Sherry and I are overwhelmed. This psalm helps give me the insight and the encouragement that I need to shepherd this flock, this church, because God has put me here 
And I thank you guys for realizing that and for loving us and accepting us so much. Because if I looked at the distractions of the world and stuff, I'd say, I can't handle this, God. Surely this isn't what you want. That's a giant over there I'm facing. And I'm just a little shepherd boy. But he says to walk by faith, not by sight. And I thank and praise God that He has given us this church to serve in. Thank you so much. Father, help us to be the sheep of Your pasture. Lord, help us to live a life that brings glory and honor to You. We thank You so much for this fold. Lord, that You have given us each other and that we are bound by one Spirit to serve one God. We thank You for the love of the shepherd who watches over his sheep. We thank You for Your love that You would send Your only Son to die for us. Lord, help us to realize what we are working forward to, the salvation of our souls. We thank You for the example that Jesus sent. We thank You for the privilege of being the light and salt to this earth, the hands and feet of Jesus. Help us to realize that and love one another. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you to love one another. Help us to realize that so that we can bring more sheep into the fold. And we just thank You and praise You for You deserve our praise, glory, and honor. In the name of Jesus, we come to the Father. Amen.